All right, let's dive into The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. We've got film reviews, behind the scenes stuff, even some Wikipedia rabbit holes. And uh, our mission is to find out why this 1953 monster movie still matters today. Yeah, it's a wild ride from the page to the screen with a good dose of, you know, that Cold War paranoia. Okay, so let's start with the creature itself, the, uh, the Redosaurus. You know, this prehistoric thing is the heart of the movie, but where did it even come from? Well, you might know Ray Bradbury from his, you know, his sci-fi books, but did you know he almost created the Redosaurus? Wait, really? I know Bradbury wrote some some creepy stories, but I didn't realize he had, like, a hand in this monster movie. Oh, he did. So picture this. Bradbury's walking along the coast, right, haunted by the sound of foghorns, and bam, inspiration hits him. He writes a short story called The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms which he later renamed The Foghorn. So how did a short story turn into a, a full-blown monster movie? Well, now that's where things get messy. Like, Bradbury claimed his idea was basically taken by uh, by one of the film's producers, Hal Chester. Oh, no. So was there a big legal battle? It's more of a Hollywood mystery than a courtroom drama. Apparently, Bradbury was asked to read, like, an early script and just like recognized his monster in their monster. He even said that Chester, the producer, went white as a sheet when he was uh, when he was confronted. So what happened? Did did Bradbury get any credit? Here's the thing. He got a two thousand dollar check and an opening credit. But to this day, there are, you know, conflicting stories about who approached who and when. Was it, you know, was it a total steal, a misunderstanding? Or maybe a little bit of both. We might never know. Wow, talk about a shadowy origin story. <laughs> but even with all that drama, the film still needed someone to, to bring this beast to life on screen. Enter Ray Harryhausen, the stop-motion wizard. I've heard that name, yeah. Yeah. Wasn't he, like, behind some other famous movie monster? Oh, you bet. Okay, so get this. The studio initially wanted to use either a guy in a rubber suit or a real live alligator for the Ritasaurus. Hold on, a real alligator. Yeah. I can't even imagine how that would even work. Thankfully, Harryhausen stepped in and convinced them that stop motion was the way to go. He argued that stop motion, you know, it brings a soul to monsters. It brings a certain weight and physicality that, you know, a guy in a suit or a real animal just couldn't replicate. And he had the experience. He'd worked with Willis O'Brien, the, the mastermind behind the original King Kong on Mighty Joe Young, you know, King Kong's cousin. So he knew how to bring giant creatures to life. So how did Harryhausen, like, go about designing the Redosaurus? He wanted something, you know, totally new, not just, like, a another dinosaur. And his early designs, you know, they went through all these changes, pointy ears, a beak, even uh, even webbed hands at one point. It's crazy to think about all the, the different ways it could have looked. So how did he, like, land on the final design? He eventually settled on, you know, the iconic look we know, the, the four-legged stance, the spiky back, those massive jaws. And that four-legged stance was, like, a choice, you know? To set it apart from those typical two-legged carnivore dinosaurs gave it a more, you know, unique and unsettling look. It's interesting how even those small choices can change how we see a monster. So what about the name Redosaurus? Any special meaning there? Well, there's this fan theory that's always going around that, you know, the name's a nod to Harryhausen's initials. R.H. He always denied it, of course. But it's a, it's a fun little thing. Whether it was intentional or not, it definitely stuck. But yeah. now this beast needs a story, mm -hmm. right? What kind of havoc does the Redosaurus wreak in the film? The film, it takes us from the Arctic all the way to New York City. It starts with an H-bomb test in the Arctic very, very timely, you know, for the, the 1950s and all the anxieties. And uh, and it accidentally wakes up the Redosaurus from its icy sloop. Oh, so the monster's unleashed by by us messing with, with powerful forces. Mm. Sounds like there's a message in there. What happens next? Well, this beast doesn't just take a stroll. It sinks ships takes out a lighthouse, which is a direct nod to Bradbury's story, and finally, you know, makes it to Manhattan for full-blown chaos. <laughs> and the film, you know, it really builds up the tension as this prehistoric behemoth, you know, leaves this path of destruction. And uh, and to make it even scarier, turns out it's carrying a deadly, you know, prehistoric disease. Whoa. This thing is a walking biohazard. So how much damage are we talking about? Well, a newspaper report in the film estimates a pretty terrifying toll. Um, 180 known dead, 1,500 injured, and get this, $300 million in damages. 
Can you imagine the the headlines if that happened today? It's a, it's a chilling reminder of the chaos a creature like that could unleash. Yeah. But you mentioned there's more to the beast from 20,000 right. Fathoms than just, you know, mindless monster mayhem, right? Oh, absolutely. You can't ignore, you know, all those anxieties of the atomic age, right? They're woven throughout the whole film. I mean, the Ritosaurus becomes like the symbol for how destructive nuclear weapons can be. You know, a force of nature we kind of let loose by messing up. It's like the film showing us what we were worried about with the atomic bomb. Yeah, right? exactly. It taps into that that fear of the unknown. You know, and like the unintended consequences of our actions, it makes you think, what else is out there that we might accidentally wake up? Speaking of lurking, uh -huh. the film's score really adds to that feeling like, you know, the unease and dread. That music is intense. Yeah, it was done by David Butoff. It's a it's what you'd call brassier and more bombastic, which really captures the scale and danger of the film. I mean, close your eyes and imagine this huge brass score playing as the Ritosaurus rampages. It's like the music itself is another monster stomping around. Yeah, it really sets the tone for those epic, you know, scenes of destruction. Mm. But wasn't there some behind the scenes drama with the score? You're right. There was another score originally by Michael Michelet, but Warner Bros. decided to uh, to replace it with Butoff's work. Oh, wow. Why did they do that? Apparently, Harryhausen preferred the original, you know, thought it was more subtle and atmospheric, but... You can't deny that Budolf's score, I mean, with its power and bombast, it really helped the film, uh, you know, helped it become what it is. It's fascinating how different creative choices can can change a film's impact. You know, so we've got this radioactive dinosaur rampaging through New York City, a score that will make your heart jump out of your chest. Yeah. What's like what's the legacy of the beast from 20,000 Fathoms. Well, it pretty much kicked off like a whole wave of creature features in the 50s and 60s. It was a huge hit and proved that audiences wanted these kinds of stories. Monsters, mayhem, that mix of sci-fi and horror. It's like it opened the floodgates for, for yeah. giant monsters to take over Hollywood. You could say that. And we can't talk about the beast without mentioning its uh, its connection to a certain other giant monster. You mean Godzilla? Yeah, I knew there was a link there. Mm. I mean, both films have these giant monsters woken up by atomic testing, both wreaking havoc on, on cities. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Beast from 20,000 Fathoms is often seen as like a direct inspiration for Godzilla, which came out, you know, just a year later in 54. And the similarities, they're pretty clear. It's crazy how one film sparked a whole like monster movie subgenre that's still going on today. Yeah. What about its impact on like more modern filmmakers? Oh, some of the modern masters of monster movies, you know, like Spielberg and Del Toro, they've said they owe a lot to uh to the beast from 20,000 Fathoms. They loved how it blended spectacle and storytelling, you know, primal fear and visual wonder. It's like a direct line from this 1953 classic yeah, yeah. to the creature features we're watching now. Yeah. Now let's get into some specifics. That opening scene, the atomic bomb test, it really sets the stage for all the chaos. Yeah. It's not just a visual thing, you know. It taps into those those very real fears of the Cold War, those anxieties about the power of nuclear weapons. I mean, think about it. This was just a few years after Hiroshima and Nagasaki, so those fears were, like, really fresh for people back then. Right. It's like the film is saying, hey, we've unleashed something we can't control, and now we got to deal with it. Yeah. And to make it even more unsettling, the Rita source comes out of this atomic cloud like, yeah. like it was born from our mistakes. Exactly. It's like a symbol of those unintended consequences, a force of nature that we woke up by messing with the very fabric of, you know, of existence. And, and it's not just the story. The way Harryhausen brings the Redosaurus to life is amazing. Yeah. You, you really believe this thing is tearing up Manhattan. Yeah. The stop motion is, it's so good, so convincing that it still holds up even compared to, you know, CGI today. It shows his skill and artistry. You know, it's not just about moving the creature around. Harryhausen gives it, gives the Rita Source a personality. There's this, uh, you know, there's the sadness in the way it moves, almost like, you know, a creature out of time thrown into a world that doesn't recognize it. That's that's interesting. It's not just a mindless monster. There's more to it. It's almost kind of tragic. Exactly, and that makes the film more than just a, a simple monster movie. Speaking of, there's that scene where the Rita Source attacks the lighthouse. You know, that nod to Bradbury's story. It's yeah. this haunting image, the waves crashing, the lighthouse keeper yelling, and then boom, this massive creature coming out of the fog. Uh, that whole sequence is like a lesson in suspense. It builds so slowly, this yeah. creeping dread, and then explodes into, you know, this, this outburst of destruction. It's primal terror. And then, of course, there's the big finale, the uh, the Rita Soros's rampage through New York. It's... 
you know, it's a classic monster movie thing, the creature destroying a big city. But Harryhausen, he makes it special. The stop motion is so good, you really think this thing is tearing through Manhattan. The way it smashes through buildings, throws cars around like they're toys, it's pure mayhem on film. And that shot of it roaring amongst the skyscrapers, it's unforgettable. And the sound design, right. The screeching metal, buildings crumbling, people screaming, it, it pulls you in. It's like you're right there in the chaos, feeling the ground shake as the Redosaurus, you know, stomps through the city. And don't forget the added tension from the prehistoric disease, you know, the one the Redosaurus is carrying. It's not just a physical threat, it's a biological one, too. Right. Like, this monster is a walking extinction event. The military can't just blow it up because because they can spread the disease. they got to get creative. And that takes us to the final showdown, Coney Island. Who knew a monster movie would end on a roller coaster? It's such a, a cool set piece. You've got Professor Nesbitt, the paleontologist who found the Redosaurus, and Corporal Stone, a military guy, racing up this roller coaster trying to get a clear shot. And that final shot, the, uh, the radioactive isotope hitting the creature right as the roller coaster plummets. Pure movie magic. It's a good ending for such a powerful creature. And the image of the amusement park, you know, on fire with the Redosaurus silhouetted against it. It's stunning. Yeah. And symbolic, too. Yeah. It's almost like the Redosaurus takes a piece of our world with it when it dies. Like a reminder of all the chaos of the price we paid for messing with, you know, the natural order. Now, we can't forget about the humans in all this. There's a love story between... Um, Professor Nisbet and Lee Hunter. She's a she's a paleontologist too. Yeah, their relationship it adds a human touch to the film. Reminds us that even with all the spectacle and destruction, there are still people who care about each other and are just trying to you know survive this whole thing. And it's interesting how Lee she helps Nesbitt convince people that the Redosaurus is real. Yeah. At first, you know, she doesn't believe it, like any good scientist, right? Yeah. But then when she sees the evidence. She comes around. She represents, like, you know, a balance of science and compassion. She's not just some damsel in distress. She's actively fighting against the monster. It reminds us that even in these crazy situations, it's our human connections and our ability to think and work together that help us overcome things. So we have this perfect mix. A giant prehistoric monster, Cold War fears, a little romance, and some groundbreaking special effects. No wonder Beast from 20,000 Fathoms became so popular. It, it connected with people on so many levels, you know? It tapped into those primal fears, the anxieties of the atomic age, the fascination with giant monsters, and it did it all with such style and, and storytelling that it set a new standard for the genre. And even though it was made over 70 years ago, it can still, you know, captivate and frighten audiences today. It really shows the power of a well-made monster movie and you know those primal fears that these creatures bring out in us now one thing that really stuck with me is how how beast from Twenty Thousand fathoms really nails that feeling of helplessness when you're up against something much bigger than you yeah there's this constant dread this feeling that you know humanity just can't match the retosaurus like we're mm -hmm. ants facing a giant's foot right it's not just about fighting the monster but trying to understand it predict what it'll do finding a weakness we can exploit and the film shows how this affects the characters. There's this, you know, weariness, a sense of being totally worn out as they realize just how big this threat is. They're not, you know, invincible action heroes. They're just normal people thrown into this insane situation. It's like they're fighting a losing battle, but they keep fighting because what else can they do? And that, you know, that determination, that refusal to quit, it makes their win even more uh, satisfying. And speaking of winning, that last showdown on the roller coaster, it's brilliant filmmaking. Action, suspense, visual spectacle, it's got it all. I love how Harryhausen uses the roller coaster itself, you know, like it's part of the fight. It's not just a background, it's like another character. The Redosaurus smashing against the track, sparks flying, the coaster derailing, it's, it's visual poetry. And the symbolism too, right? The amusement park, a place for fun and laughter, getting destroyed by this creature from millions of years ago. It's like a reminder that even in our modern world, we're still vulnerable to the forces of nature. And the fact that it all happens on a roller coaster, something so carefree and exciting, it adds this this layer of irony, like innocence being shattered by, you know, the harshness of the world. It's a brilliant way to contrast the, you know, the innocence of childhood with 
the the harsh realities of the world and it makes the Rita source's death even more powerful this creature that survived for millions of years brought down by a single shot on this uh you know rickety amusement park ride it really says something about human ingenuity and how we adapt and overcome things it's it's almost poetic this clash of the old and the new the natural and the uh the man-made and it speaks to how powerful the beast from 20,000 fathoms is on the surface, it might seem like a simple monster movie, but underneath there are all these layers of meaning and symbolism that, you know, that still resonate with people today. Now, another thing that struck me was how the film uses sound to create this feeling of unease and, you know, dread. Mm. Yeah. The sound design is often overlooked, but it's so important in setting the mood. It uses these low rumbles and roars that, like, really get to you. It's like you can feel feel the Ritasaurus even when you can't see it. Like a heartbeat, right? This primal rhythm that runs through the whole film, reminding us that danger is always there. And the way they use sound to build up tension in those scenes where the creature's, you know, stalking its prey. You hear a floorboard creak, a leaky faucet, a roar in the distance, all these little things that make you feel uneasy and make you wait for something to happen. You know something's coming, but you don't know when or where. It's like, you know, when you're walking alone at night and hear footsteps behind you, you turn around and no one's there. Exactly. That that primal fear of the unknown, of what's hiding in the shadows. And then when the Ritasaurus finally attacks, the sound just explodes. Those roars are deafening, buildings crashing sound so real, and the screams chilling. It's all meant to pull you in, like you're right there in the middle of it all. And speaking of being pulled in, did you notice how the film uses lighting and shadows to make the Ritasaurus seem even more monstrous? There are like a lot of scenes where it's partly hidden in shadow, making it look even bigger and scarier. It's a classic horror movie trick, but Harryhausen uses it so well. Like the darkness itself is hiding the monster. Right making it even scarier because you can't see exactly. it vaguely. It plays on our fear of the unknown of what's lurking in the dark. Exactly. It plays on our fear of what we don't know, what's in the dark. And there's that scene in the Arctic when they first see the Ritosaurus. It's it's just a shape against the snow, but it's so creepy and unsettling. Like the creature is a like a hole in the landscape, this darkness against all that white. Perfect example of how, you know, less is more in horror. Just hinting at a threat can be scarier than seeing it up close. Our imaginations are often much better at scaring us than any filmmaker. And how they use light in those New York City scenes is is really cool, too. The contrast, you know, between the bright city streets and the dark shape of the Ritasaurus, like this, this primal darkness invading our modern world. Creates this feeling of the city being swallowed up by this this primal force, like nature's taking back what we built. And there are a lot of shots where, you know, the Ritasaurus is lit up by streetlights or headlights and it makes its scales shimmer, its eyes glow. It's like these quick glimpses are meant to to fascinate us and scare us at the same time. It's those little touches that bring the creature to life and make it so scary. They remind us that this isn't some, you know, ancient creature from a long time ago. It's a real threat right here, right now, hiding in the shadows of our own cities. Now let's talk about the cultural impact of the beast from 20,000 Fathoms. This film wasn't just entertainment. It it also tapped into some real anxieties of the time. Yeah, it's very much a film of its time, reflecting those Cold War fears about, you know, the atomic bomb. The Ritasaurus becomes the symbol of that destructive power, this uncontrollable force that could wipe everything out. It's like, like our worst nightmares come to life on screen. It's like the film saying, look, we created this monster. Now we got to deal with it. Mm. Are we ready to face the consequences of what we've done? Exactly. It taps into that feeling of, you know, helplessness, that fear that we've gone too far, that there's no going back. And it's interesting how the film uses the Ritasaurus to look at, like, scientific responsibility. Hmm. There's this tension between the scientists who are trying to understand it and the military who just want to, you know, blow it up. It's that classic clash between knowledge and action. It reflects the debates that were happening back then about the role of science and technology in society. Should we push the boundaries, even if it means, you know, unleashing things we can't control? And the film doesn't give you a simple answer. It shows the dangers of scientific progress. But it also says that science might be our only hope to save ourselves. It's a complicated issue, and the film dives into that. It makes us ask those tough questions about our place in the world and what happens when we mess with things. And it's not just the atomic bomb. The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms also touches on, like, environmental destruction the consequences of messing with the natural world. Right. The Ritasaurus, this creature that's been sleeping peacefully for millions of years, 
is woken up by us, by our nuclear tests in its home. It's a reminder that what we do has an impact. We can't just exploit nature without expecting some kind of, you know, pushback. It's like nature's fighting back, reminding us we're not the only ones on this planet. It's a theme that means even more today, right? Yeah. As we deal with climate change and how we're hurting the planet. The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms is a warning. It says we need to be careful about how we treat the environment. We might not be waking up giant radioactive dinosaurs, but our actions are having a big impact and we got to take responsibility for that. It suggests that if we're not careful, we'll create our own monsters, both literal and, you know, figurative ones. What we do matters and those consequences, well, they can come back to bite us. Let's dive into the film's legacy now. This is where it gets really interesting. This film changed cinema. It's considered the, the grandfather of giant monster movies, the one that started that whole craze in the 50s. You're absolutely right. It paved the way for Godzilla, them, Tarantula, and so many others. And you can see its influence even today in in modern monster movies like Cloverfield, Pacific Rim. It's like the beast from 20,000 Fathoms planted the seeds for a whole genre of monster movies. It's amazing how one film made with a pretty small budget over 70 years ago could have such a big and lasting impact on cinema, you know? It comes down to a few things. A good story, those groundbreaking special effects by, you know, Ray Harryhausen, and how the film taps into those primal fears of the unknown. It's a powerful mix that still works today. And that awesome score by David Budolf, it adds to the film's, you know, grand scale. It's like the music is making the emotions of the story bigger, making the action more exciting, and the drama more, well, more dramatic. Absolutely. That music is iconic. It just captures the mood of the film perfectly. It's heroic, suspenseful, and in the end, triumphant. One thing that always gets me is the connection between, you know, the beast from 20,000 Fathoms and Godzilla. It's pretty obvious that the Japanese filmmakers were inspired by Harryhausen's work. Yeah, the similarities are clear. Both have these giant monsters woken up by atomic testing, both destroying cities. It's interesting to see how, you know, those themes of nuclear fear and the consequences of science were explored in both American and Japanese cinema back then. Shows how universal those themes were, you know, how they connected with people all over the world. Everyone was dealing with those anxieties after World War II and, you know, at the start of the atomic age. And Godzilla became a huge global phenomenon, leading to all those sequels and, you know, starting a whole new genre of kaiju films. It's wild to think that it all started, in a way, with... The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. And it's like that butterfly effect, right? One film starts a chain reaction that's still going on. Reminds us that even small films can have a big impact. Their ideas can travel through time, influence other artists, and inspire new things. And The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms is still celebrated today, you know, by film fans and critics. It's a classic. And even though it's old, it still holds up. It shows how strong a good story can be. And the skill of Ray Harryhausen, who made the Ritasaurus so believable and memorable. It's a film that's fun and makes you think. A monster movie with a message. It reminds us that sometimes the biggest threats come from our own minds. It makes us think about our place in the world and what happens when we make bad choices. And you know, what really gets me is how the film builds up this dread, this anticipation before we even see the whole Rita source. It's like the filmmakers are teasing us, letting our imaginations run wild before finally showing us the creature. That's so true. There are those spooky reports, you know, strange things happening in the Arctic, whispers wow. of something monstrous hiding under the ice. And then that scene where Professor Nesbitt sees the Rita source for the first time we just get glimpses, you know, its footprints in the snow, its shadow over the ice. It's like the film saying, something's out there, something big and dangerous, and it's coming. It's all about suggestion, building up the tension, letting our own minds create something much scarier than what they could actually show us. And when the Rita source finally shows up, it's so much scarier because we've been waiting for it, dreading it. It's like all that tension explodes and it works perfectly. And the way they use sound to build tension is amazing. Lots of scenes where you hear the Ritasaurus before you see it, those deep roars echoing through the sea. They're so good at making you feel uneasy and scared. It's like this constant presence, right? Always lurking, always a threat. The sand is almost physical. You can feel it. It speaks to our deepest fears. And that roar, the Ritasaurus's roar, one of the most famous sounds in movies. It still gives me chills. It shows how talented the sound designers were. They created this soundscape that's both real and, you know, otherworldly. It captures the Ritasaurus perfectly. They understood that sound could be just as scary as what you see. Now, one thing that really makes the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms stand out from other monster movies of that time is the scale. Yeah. 
It's not just some creature attacking a small town. The Rhinosaurus attacks New York City, one of the biggest, busiest cities in the world. This is a monster movie on an epic scale. It raises the stakes, for sure. It's not just a few lives at risk. We're talking millions of people threatened by this creature. And the film shows that scale really well. The shots of the Rhinosaurus towering over skyscrapers, crowds running through the streets, it creates this feeling of chaos, like total helplessness. It's like the city itself is a character, and it's losing this fight against nature. And the destruction is, it's real, you know? Yeah. The Rhinosaurus doesn't just knock over a few buildings, it levels entire blocks. It's amazing that Ray Harryhausen, using stop motion, could create such believable destruction. It shows you that even with, you know, simple technology, you can still create amazing visuals if you have talent and vision. It's about using what you have creatively, you know, finding ways to tell the story visually. Now, let's not forget the human side of the story amidst all this monster mayhem. It's easy to get caught up in the spectacle of the Rhinosaurus, but the film has some really interesting characters and relationships, too. Professor Nesbitt and Lee Hunter. Their relationship is particularly interesting. They start as colleagues, a little skeptical of each other, but they have to team up to stop the creature, and their relationship changes. There's a real sense of, you know, respect and teamwork that grows between them as they face this danger together. They're not just flat characters. They have depth motivations. Nesbitt feels guilty, you know, for his part in waking up the Raidosaurus, mm -hmm. and Lee, well... She doesn't believe him at first, but then she sees the truth. They're both flawed characters who have to face their own weaknesses. And it's their knowledge and determination that ultimately brings down the Rhinosaurus. It reminds us that even when things seem impossible, human ingenuity and teamwork can win. We can do amazing things when we work together. Now, one thing I always loved about the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms is the atmosphere. It's so good at creating suspense and dread. There's this feeling that something bad's about to happen, you know? The film uses a lot of those classic horror movie tricks. Shadowy shots, jump scares, creepy sound effects. And being in black and white, it makes it even creepier. It's like the film's taking it back to a time when things were simpler, but maybe also more dangerous. And there's this, this rawness to how the film looks. It's not polished and shiny like modern films. It's got grit. It feels more real. It shows you that you don't need CGI or fancy effects to make a truly scary monster movie. Sometimes all you need is a good story, someone talented like Ray Harryhausen, and, you know, a willingness to just suggest things. Let the audience's imagination do the rest. That's often much scarier. The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms is a film that's both entertaining and thought-provoking. It's a classic monster movie that has a lot to say. It makes us think about our place in the world and the consequences of our choices. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive. And for our listeners, here's something to think about. Could a film like The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms be made today, you know, and still have that same sense of wonder and fear? Or have our fears and how we see the world changed too much? We'd love to hear your thoughts.